Okay, great. So we should be ready to get started. So welcome everyone. Uh, intro to Android development lecture six. Today we're going to be going over like a really exciting topic that is genuinely like insanely important. Like pretty much every app on your phone uses the internet, right? So that's, it, it's a really important concept. We're going to go over networking. Like how do we actually interface with a backend that's made for our app, right? How are we going to interface with that? How are we going to get information from it? How are we going to send information to it? That's all under this like really important bubble called networking. So uh, yeah, that's one of the main things we're going to be doing today. The other thing is persistent storage. So like if you ever like type something in like on your notes app, right? And you close out of your notes app, what you typed in isn't just going to go away. It's going to stay there. And that's called persistent storage. So we're going to go over that today as well. Um, so we're going to start off with our Kahoot. So, um, yeah, so you just join that. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, let me see. Eight people. Um, and I think, wait, I'm trying to correct them. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's it now. Okay. Uh, just like one final call. If you're not in, please raise your hand. It's okay if you haven't had a chance to get in. Yet. Okay, okay, awesome. All right, let's get started. Okay, so starting off with a bit of review, bit of review. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So we think of a fragment as a reusable portion of the UI. So one of the main reasons that we use fragments is that they come with this new instance method. And this new instance method like allows us to define these parameters that we can pass into our fragment. And these parameters allow fragments to basically be reusable, right? So in homework five, you were passing in, uh, you're probably passing in like the picture ID for the picture that you wanted to get into your fragment. And that, that like picture ID, right? You're reusing that same fragment to display different pictures. So it can be thought of like as a reusable portion of your UI. Yeah. Is Oh, like, 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 okay. yeah, I understand why you might think that. You're just like a little bit late to posting it. So it is on like CMS right now. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so it was due Sunday night. Oh, I yeah. Uh, I yeah, I think we posted it around like 6 p.m. Maybe, maybe a bit earlier. Um, so yeah, I can it. If you just like show me uh your work, like come to come to the end of class and talk to me. I'll make sure that you like get credit for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh okay. So next question. So I know I had a similar question before. Uh and I was asking for the types, but this time I'm just saying, like, what are the parameters like generally? What do we want to pass in uh, at like a high level, conceptual, not really like the specific types of the parameters? Let's see, what do we think for this one? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so it seems like a lot of you read my explanation on Ed, which is great. So we have like a small bug in the last demo, but um, basically the idea is that when you're passing in uh, to replace, you actually want the parent container view um, 
that that like your fragment is going to be in. So I would basically have this fragment manager and it's going to manage like which fragments are where, right? So I would have like one parent view that's, and I was basically telling the code, like whatever, like the child of this, of this view is going to contain the fragment that I want. And then the replace method is going to basically take whatever is inside that parent view and replace it with your new fragment. So that's the idea for replace. Um, in terms of like fragment context, I kind of just put that one there to throw you off. Like you don't actually need context when you're using the um, replace method for the support fragment manager. So yeah. Now review all the way back to permissions. Let's see if anyone can get this. Okay, 50-50. So image library references like basically the camera or the camera roll of the user, right? So if we wanted to access the user's camera roll, that would be a dangerous permission because their camera roll can contain like sensitive photos that we might not necessarily want to expose, right? So that's a dangerous permission. However, just accessing the internet is a normal permission. And the reason that I include this question is because today in networking, you're going to have to access the internet. And what you'll notice is that if you try to access the internet without putting this normal permission in your manifest, your app will crash because it lacks the permission to access the internet. So when you put this permission in your manifest, that will allow your app to access the internet. And because the internet is a normal permission, that means we don't actually have to request it from the user. So we don't have to worry about requesting it but we still have to declare that our app needs it. So that's something pretty important to keep in mind today, that internet access is a normal permission. So, uh, yeah. A little bit of a long one here. <laughs> okay. So we went over this a little bit. Let's see if anyone can get this. Okay, yeah, so JSON is the correct answer. So just as a refresher, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, right? So it is the main way that, like when you send a request to an API, it basically needs to return to you the data. And this data could be in the form of some complex object, right? So we need a universal way of like representing objects as strings because strings are the easiest thing that we have to just pass around like over the internet, right? So this universal method is uh, called JSON, JavaScript object notation. We'll go into that a bit more today as well. But uh, in terms of like bundle of key value pairs, that is like a data representation that we use in Android, but that's not actually what we use when we're doing network requests, so. Last question. Okay, glad most of you thought it was reasonable. I did see like more posts on Ed for this homework than usual, I feel like. So uh, I wanted to get a sense of what everyone thought. Sorry for the person who thought it was super hard. Uh, hopefully you went to office hours. Uh, yeah, okay. And our leaderboard. All right, nice shot, everyone. Um, okay, so let me bring up the slides. Okay, perfect. All right, so welcome to lecture six once again. Uh, let's just let's just jump right into it. So in terms of announcements. We do have the hack challenge coming up. Uh, Sophie is going to post some information on Ed with like more details about the timeline. But um, essentially, just to give you like a brief intro again, like more formal details are going to be on Ed. But just a brief intro on like what the hack challenge is, in case you aren't aware. I think Sophie might have mentioned this last lecture as well. But just to reiterate, you're basically going to be working on an app uh, in a group with other students who are taking the app dev like development courses and potentially design courses as well. So it's gonna be like a really good opportunity for you to collaborate with different engineers and try to 
basically build a project that you're going to submit to our hack challenge. Uh, so yeah, this project is like a pretty big portion of your grade. So definitely keep it in mind and uh, look on Ed for what Sophie is going to post later. So, uh, okay, cool. So let's talk about data paradigms. So I like to use uh, fancy language, but don't be scared. Um, data paradigms, basically just talking about different ways that we represent data and how we like pass data around our app, right? So let's start. Um, so bundles, this was like briefly mentioned in the Kahoot. Um, it's just it's just like a good example of a data paradigm in Android. So uh, I think like many of you should already know what a bundle is when you worked with that with like fragments and activities, right? So it's a key value pair mapping. So you're, you're going to have a key, uh, like for example, in your, uh, when you were, passing data between activity, you would use that like put string or put int method, right? And the first parameter to that method was always a string. And that was always your key. It's saying, where am I going to find this value? Like what string do I have to put in to try to get this value, right? So that's your key. And then your value is like what, yeah, like the actual value of it, right? So uh, if you, if you want to like put in the tab number for homework five, right? Maybe you want to put that in. Your key might be like tab number and then your value could be whatever index you're at, right? So it's kind of similar to a hash map if you're aware of what that is. And yeah, and I guess like the, the reason that I mentioned this, even though you may already know bundles, is that um, JSON objects are can be like sort of thought of pretty similar to bundles and that they are like key value pair mappings. It's just that um, it's a like specific notation of the way that we do it. So we would put our key and then a colon and then the value. And that value is either going to be like an object, right? And actually, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more in depth later. But um, yeah, I'll, I think I'll show an example of JSON later. But just keep in mind this idea of key value pairs. It's pretty important to networking. Uh, yeah, and like here's our sample implementation of a bundle. So uh, in this case, we're using that put string method right? And we're adding like some transaction. And then the string that we're putting in is actually transaction JSON. So we can actually put in JSON strings uh, and put that in our bundle as like a way of storing complex objects, right? Because when you have a bundle, you might have put string, you might have put in, but what if you have like some more complex object that you want to try to pass around? between activities, that's when like you can use JSON. So this is like an example of essentially using JSON to pass in, like pass around more complex objects throughout your activities. So does anyone have any questions on like the fundamental ideas of bundles or anything? Okay, cool. So now we're gonna talk about like another pattern which you're gonna see in Android development, which is a singleton, right? So Basically, the idea of a singleton is that let's say that I have a um, a specific way of parsing JSON. Like I want to parse it in this specific way with this resources, and I want to create like some JSON parser object. And this JSON parser object, right? I'm gonna I could like feed it JSON, and then it would parse the correct thing and give me back like the object that I want, right? So. The thing is, it doesn't really make sense to make a new JSON parser every single time you want to parse JSON, because really, you're probably only going to be parsing JSON in like a single way. So that's when you can use like the singleton, pa singleton pattern. So for example, I might have a singular JSON parser that I uh, initialize when I'm creating my app. And then I'm going to like sort of pass that around to different instances of my app and like reuse that component in this way. It, it creates a single source of truth. So that's another pretty important concept is that if I have like multiple different ways of parsing JSON or something like that, then the issue is that if I parse JSON like in one part of the code and I use a different parser in like another part, right? I don't have the guarantee that they're going to be parsed the same way. So if you have a single source of truth and you know you're getting like all your data from the same place, I think a much better example actually would be, um, let's just say like your, your networking API. So your networking API, that's basically, the idea of that is you have, you might have a class that will have a bunch of methods that can access specific points 
on your back end. So like when you're in the hack challenge, you're going to be given like some back end and this back end is going to have essentially like different access points that you can use to get data. So like on volume, for example, uh, there's like an access point to get all of the flyers that are on the app. There's an access point to get all the articles on the app, right? So I want to be accessing those access points basically the same way that the, like the same way every time. And that's like another instance of like the singleton pattern where I might have one like singular instance of a networking API. And then I use that instance. I reuse that instance throughout the app to make all of my network calls. So yeah, I know this is kind of, this is kind of like an abstract concept. Uh, anyone have any questions about that? Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it'll make also make more sense like if you see a specific example of it. I, I think also it appears more commonly in like large scale apps. So the kind of apps that like we're working on just like for the assignment, you might not end up using it, but I think it's still really good to know and just have this idea. So uh, yeah, okay. So here's like an example implementation, right? So in this case, you can sort of think of this. Um, this one is actually called a repository. Um, but don't really worry about that. You can sort of just think of it as like our network API example. So we have this flyer repository, right? Uh, for, for volume, this is actually code I, I wrote for volume. Um, so we have this flyer repository, which is an object. And this in this object, I wanna use the same flyer repository throughout my application, right? I wanna, get, I wanna be getting flyers from the, same, from the same place. I wanna keep everything really consistent. So I have one, flyer repository. And this contains all the ways that I'm going to get flyers and how I'm going to get these flyers. So if I'm using the same flyer repository throughout my application, then that ensures that I'm getting flyers the same way, uh, even, even at different screens, right? So it helps keep everything really consistent. Um, so don't get like too bogged down in the syntax here. I know there's like, uh, I guess like that at singleton is pretty important. That just like basically tells Kotlin like, hey, this class is a singleton. And that at inject constructor, that's like a bit more advanced. I'd say don't really worry about that for now. But, um, and, and like a lot of this is like, actually a lot of this really, you wouldn't really know. But I think the high level, at, high, at a high level, you can see we have a class and this class has methods, right? And it's a singleton class. So we're going to be reusing these methods throughout our app. Okay, cool. So that's just a bit about like common like patterns you'll see in networking and persistent storage. So now we're going to talk about local persistent storage. So yeah, like as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, if the user leaves the app, then all of their data is lost. That's a pretty big issue, right? So how are we going to preserve their data? So there's two main ways. We can do it with local storage. And there's two like main libraries that we use for local storage in Android development. So one is called shared preferences. That one's a lot simpler, and we're going to be using this one throughout the course. And there's also another more modern library, which uh, we're, we're covering like newly this semester, which is data store. Uh, this isn't going to be like required on any of the assignments since it's a bit more complicated to use. And some of the functionality of it is not really in scope of this course, but I did want to expose everyone to it since this is like the sort of like the new standard for storing data locally. Uh, right. And then the other way we can persist data is cloud storage, but we'll get into that a bit more for networking. Okay. So in, so this is where we're going to use this idea of like bundles and key value pairs, right? So we're going to be storing key value pairs in our app. And these preferences that we have need to be shared across fragments. So I think a really good example of like a potential preference you might have is dark mode. So your app might have like different themes like light mode and dark mode. And every screen you want to know, like, is the user in light mode or is the user in dark mode, right? So like, for example, I could store a key value pair here that says like I could, I could put in mode as my key and then my value could be dark or light. And that would help us know, like, is the user in dark mode? Is the user in light mode, right? So uh, that's like a good example of like what you might do. And here is just like a general overview of like what the syntax would look like. So the first thing is that we have to get our shared preferences. We have to know uh, like what, like basically throughout the app, we we're going to be using 
a preference file. So this right here, this um, uh, this is for volume again. So volume underscore preferences. That's the name of the shared preferences file. So whenever you use shared preferences in Android, uh, the Android OS will actually create a file on the user's phone with the name that you put right here in get shared preferences. So I basically just created a like a blank preferences file on the user's phone called volume preferences. This context mode private basically means other apps don't have access to this file, which is good, right? Because you might have like sensitive information in there. So usually you should use a uh, mode private. And then once we actually get a reference to our shared preferences file, we want to like use an editor. So we just declare our editor and that's just going to be dot edit. And now we can use the editor to do this like put string method that we're pretty familiar with by now. So we can use put string and we can put uh, key value pairs and then we can use apply. So this is really important. Don't forget to apply the changes or else nothing will work basically. And what's nice is that the editor will give you like a little highlight if you forget to apply. So it should help you remember. And then getting preferences. So it's really important that this name of the preferences file matches here, right? Because if you try to get a preferences file and the names don't match, then it's going to look for a file on your phone that's not even there, right? So we got to make sure these names match. And then getting is also really simple. So we just use dot get string and we would use the key. And then the second parameter is a default value. So you can see I put a little comment here, but I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. So you so like let's say i put in i'm over here and i put in this key and i put in a value right but then over here i try to get a string i'm expecting that i know the user's mode already if they're in dark mode or light mode so i try to get the string by the key mode and the issue is that string is not there so what am i going to do um and if that string is not there then this then res like this result that we're getting from get string it will take on the value of the second parameter in the method. So in this case, um, if key, if there was no key uh, in our shared preferences file, then we would get the default value. So res would just become default value. Um, okay, yeah, so that's, that's a bit about the syntax for shared preferences. I think we should understand pretty much all of this. So uh, definitely like raise your hand if you have any questions on like anything up to this point. I wanna make sure everyone's up to speed. Okay, cool. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about data storage. So this is a more modern data storage solution. It overcomes a lot of the drawbacks of shared preferences. So shared preferences isn't a perfect solution. Like you can only store strings, right? And it's kind of annoying to have to be like uh, parsing JSON if you wanna store a custom object. But data store actually does allow you to store a custom object at the expense of more complexity. Um, it also uses the Kotlin coroutines framework, which is a bit more advanced. Uh, it's ba it's basically the coroutines framework is a way that we can run things in the background of our app without like disturbing the user experience. It'll it and it just helps us manage like tasks that go on in the background. So it basically uses a lot of modern ideas with Kotlin and Android development that are like unfortunately. Most of these are like outside the scope of this course because we do have limited time, but um, I do want to like, I do want you to see what this looks like because I think it is pretty interesting and something you might want to consider using. So when we read from data store, you can see like already, right? The complexity is a bit more. So um, like in terms of why we have a launch defect, I would say don't, don't really worry about that now. All the launch effect does is basically saying, it's basically saying we want to run this in the background. And the reason we want to run this in the background is because we don't want to just like wait on finding the data that we're storing uh, and like not allow the UI to update at all. Instead, we want to just get it in the background. And here we can see we actually have a flow. So this is like a completely new data structure as well. So you, I think you can sort of see why this isn't really in scope, but um, but be, because like we have a lot of these new new ideas, right? So the main idea, like, don't don't worry too much about what's actually going on here. I would say the main idea is that inside this dot collect method, this is where you're going to actually have access to what you stored. Um, so this is this is for reading from um, data. 
data store. So your key is right here, this um, example underscore counter. So this is a value that you can see has uh, this like int preferences key, right? So it's this is basically like, just think of this as uh, as like a string key, except we're just have this special type for it that's made by data store. Um, and then if we want to access this key, we use these square brackets around our preferences, right? So we try to access the key. And then and once we try to access it, uh, if it's null, like we just, you just say, okay, just let it be zero. And then once we try to access it, we can like collect it and try doing something with it. So don't worry about like the specifics of like what all the syntax means. But if you have a general overview of like, okay, I can use, I can use these square brackets to access the key. And I can use this collect method to read the value, right? If you have that general like understanding, that's great. So um, yeah, that's like a bit of an exposure to data store. And writing to data store actually uh, does look a bit simpler. So all we really have to do is use this dot edit function and we take our preferences, our preferences object. And then we set uh, sort of like how you would set an array, right? We're actually setting our preferences, um, the key, we're setting the key for our preferences to have the value 10. So yeah, that's that's how you write to data store. And again, this is just a brief introduction. Uh, if you're curious to learn more, scan that QR code that has the documentation for um, the data store library. And I think this link is also going to be on the slideshow. So I'll, I'll like update I'll update the textbook tonight with the slideshow. But uh, yeah, if you're curious to learn more, it is optional, but if you're curious to learn more, definitely take a look at the documentation. It has a lot more detailed examples, so yeah. Okay, now let's get into cloud storage. So this is like probably the most important topic of today's lecture and like arguably the entire Android course, arguably. <laughs> because the cool thing about this topic is that like no matter what type of front-end development you're doing, you're gonna have to know these concepts because you're going to be essentially like interfacing with some backend and you're going to be sending these requests to it and you're going to be reading from it. Right. So all of these, all of these things that you're learning now, you could like really apply for like any type of front end development. So, uh, yeah, let's first just discuss like some of our problems with local storage, why we like what motivates us to want to use networking. Right. So it takes up space on the user's phone. Uh, we can't store, yeah, so we can't store items in like a social context. So if we want to like post like post something somewhere, right, or uh, store it and have it be inside of like a group messaging system or something like that, obviously we can't really do that in a local context. And shared preferences, as we talked about, is limited to storing key value pairs. We know data store can overcome that limitation, but um, in like in general, yeah. So it's it's limited to storing these key value pair representations. So cloud storage, we this allows us to efficiently like retrieve complex data. And there are lots of components to retrieving data from the cloud. And this type of these components are going to be used like throughout front end development, no matter what you're doing, right? So these are sending requests to API endpoints. So sort of like what I was talking about earlier, your backend is going to have specific endpoints that when you send requests to them, they're going to give you back certain types of data. Uh, and that's like one huge part of it is how do we send the request to these API endpoints, right? Then these API endpoints are gonna return JSON. So then we have a new question, how are we going to parse this JSON? How are we gonna get this into an object that we can actually work with in Kotlin? And our third point is asynchronous programming. So when we send a network request, we have to connect to the internet. We have to send it out into the void and just hope that our backend will return their response in a reasonable amount of time. So the thing is, we don't know when this code is gonna finish. So imagine if I just, if you were using an app and like, let's say when something was loaded, like an image was loading on Instagram, the entire app just froze as that image loaded. That would be a, like a really bad experience, right? So instead we have to load that image in the background and that's where asynchronous programming comes in. And then we also have to actually access the data in our code. So there's a lot of different steps here uh, and it gets pretty complicated, but we're gonna break it down and we're going to use libraries that like geniuses have implemented and are probably like nearly flawless, right? And very efficient. And we're gonna use these this code that's already out there to 
allow us to do these complex things. And yeah, so you'll see it's it's actually not too overwhelming. So, okay. So our first is networking. So the question is, we have an, our eight, this is our step one, our, com, our first component, right? We have our API endpoint. And the question is, how do I actually get a response from that? How do I like get all the flyers and then I get some string back? What's the actual code implementation of that? So here it is. What we do is we use this library called OKHTTP. So this is an Android specific library that just allows you to make network requests. So uh, yeah, so we have our client and then we're gonna have our request. So whenever you send a request to get data, you're gonna be sending it to an endpoint. And this endpoint is represented by a URL. So in this case, there's some, there's some like local URL here, right? But usually this will be like the URL of your server. Uh, and you're, that's just gonna be the base URL. So you put in the URL that you wanna send a request to. And then this is where things get like a bit more interesting. So now we're like HTTP, okay, HTTP sort of handles the asynchronous programming part for us. So when we have this new call, we pass in our request because this request is telling, is telling okay, HTTP, it's saying, what URL do we want to use, right? So uh, I could turn on the laser pointer. There we go, more fun. Okay, <laughs> so right, we, could, we pass in this request and then we want to queue it. So we don't wanna just do it immediately. We don't want our app to freeze. We're gonna queue it and have it run in the background. And then this is like the idea of the callback function, right? So we kind of introduced a callback in homework five. Does anyone wanna try explaining like what a callback is? This is kind of kind of a tough question. Anyone anyone wanna just like have a shot? What do, what do we think a callback is? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. So I, I did like put an explanation of this on Ed. And just to refresh everyone, so a callback is basically a function. So we're, we're essentially passing in a function into this function. So, so it's saying like, when we enqueue this network request and we say, okay, we wanna run this network request in the background, then what piece of code do we want to do when we finish running it? So that's what this is, it's this callback, right? So when the request is finished, we basically call this function that we pass in. So we call whatever's in here. So on failure, right, we might send out like a failure message in the log cat, for example. And when we receive a response, right, we might get um, a body with that response. And we wanna try to get the string in that body. So the thing is, I think I've, I've advised some of you to use this on ed before with this uh, question mark dot let syntax. So the interesting thing here is this is basically saying that if res is non-null, so if we actually got a response from our API endpoint, then let's run the code inside of here. And what is the code inside of here doing? It's basically just taking the response and you can see um, that when you use let, right, if the object is not null, then it will basically be assigned to this it keyword. So in this case, this it basically refers to res, okay? And we essentially uh, pass in res into parse flyers. And this parse flyers, we're gonna go over this method a bit later, but this basically parses our JSON. So this is basically the, uh, the idea of how we're gonna send a request to our API endpoint. So we make this request object that has the URL we want to request to, we enqueue the request, and then we define, okay, what behavior do we wanna have when the request fails and what behavior do you want to have when it succeeds? Anyone have any questions at all about what you see on screen or anything? Yeah. Yeah, so parse flyers, this is a method, this is a function that I created. And on a, on a slide, like a little bit later, I'm going to be showing you like the full definition of that function. So yeah, any other questions? Okay, cool. So yeah, that's that's uh, networking. You're gonna see that during Wednesday's demo. I'm gonna go over like how we can actually do this.
Uh, oh yeah. Okay, cool. I also had these notes. I forgot about this. <laughs> yeah. So right, we enqueue our request to run asynchronously in the background. Um, if the request fails, you want to make sure you have a way of handling that, right? And yeah, so even when we get a response, that response might not have a body. It could end up being like a different response that we didn't really expect. So we have to be able to like handle this case. And that's why we have to check for like potential null values. Uh, yeah, right. So we use let. We only perform this action if it's not null, right? So I, I sort of like already went over all of this, but um, it, it's nice. So you guys have this slideshow to refer to what I was saying in lecture as well. So um, yeah. Oh yeah, I guess actually something that I didn't mention, which is good that good that uh, past me wanted to mention this, <laughs> is that this list of flyers, see this question mark, right? That means that even after we parse the JSON, it still could be null. So even after we get this response that we know is a string, right? If we parse the JSON, but the JSON doesn't conform to what we expect, then this list of flyers could still end up being null. So we need to make sure that we're like being really careful about how we handle null values throughout this entire thing. Okay, now let's talk about JSON. So this should answer your question from earlier, right? What is this parse flyers method? So this parse flyers method takes in some JSON, which is of type string, and we want to return a list of flyers. So flyers basically have these different attributes, right? They might have a start time, an end time, a title, uh, an image URL, right? And we basically want a way to get all of that stuff out of the, uh, we want to get it out of the string and into an object. And this is where we're going to use another library built by some really smart people called Moshi. So this one allows us to parse JSON, right? And the first thing that we have to do is actually create our JSON adapter. So kind of like with shared preferences, remember, we couldn't just directly edit it. We first had to get like an instance of it. And we're kind of doing something similar here. So we get an instance of a JSON adapter. So don't worry too much about the syntax here. I'd say this is more just boiler, boilerplate. Um, this line is pretty much going to be the same every time. You're just getting an instance of your JSON parser. And then what I do here, so this you might actually not have to do for um, for like everything. Depending on what you're making, you might not need this line. But in this case, I have some class already in my, uh, let's see, do I show? I think I show it a bit later. Yeah. So right here, I have this data class for flyers, right? And this has a bunch of attributes. And you can see that I have this. Um, at JSON class, generator adapter equals true. So this is another thing that Moshi allows us to do is it allows us to put this decorator. That's what this like little at is called when you have it on top of a class. So it allows us to put this decorator on top of a class. And now whenever we build our project, what's going to happen is that Moshi is going to see this decorator and it's going to automatically generate code to parse a complex JSON string into one of these objects from our data class that we made. So it's basically using our data class and generating code to parse it. So we don't have to actually make that code ourselves, which is really nice. So that's sort of like the point of this, right? We have generator adapter equals true. We want to generate an adapter for this. But the thing is that this adapter is made for uh, parsing flyer objects. But the interesting thing about this JSON, right? If I have like a list of flyers I want to show to the user and I want them to be able to scroll through it, right? That's going to be more than one, more than just a singular flyer. So in this case, I'm creating a new type called a flyer list type. And, and I'm basically taking the list class from Java and I'm merging it with my flyers class. And this is going to generate like more custom code that tells Moshi, how do I parse a list of flyers as opposed to just a single flyer, right? This tells it, how do I parse a single flyer? So I do think this is like useful to have, but if you are just parsing a single object, then you won't actually need this line. Uh, then we create our JSON adapter. So we're going to basically, this is of type JSON adapter and the JSON adapter uh, has a parameterized type. So this, so basically you have a JSON adapter and the type of that JSON adapter is going to be whatever the JSON, whatever the adapter is parsing. So, or parsing to. So in this case, it's parsing to a list of flyers. 
and uh, we use Moshi.adapter to essentially initialize this adapter. And inside of our initialization, we pass in the type that um, that we made specifically with Moshi. So in this case, it's our flyer list type. And then from here, we just return. So we use the JSON adapter and we call this method from JSON. And from JSON, that's your key method that's going to parse a string, right? So it's saying we want to get an object from JSON and then the JSON we want to get it from is this flyers JSON. Okay. Uh, so anyone have any questions at all about JSON parsing? Okay. Uh, yeah, and we can see I'm sort of going through these steps again. So this is good. You guys uh, all have this as reference, right? So we create an instance of Moshi that we're going to use for parsing our input. Um, we have this data class down here that represents our flyer object with different fields. Uh, also, I feel like I, I never really gave like a formal introduction to what a data class was, but I know that you have had to use it for your assignments. Does anyone have any questions about data classes? Because I know it's like it's kind of been glossed over, but um, if anyone anyone has any questions about that, please please let me know. Definitely, be happy to answer. Okay, yeah, uh, cool. So so yeah, this is like just defining the way that our object is represented. So it's gonna have an ID of string, right? It's gonna have a title of string. It's gonna have an or like these organizations, right? So, um, yeah. So that's that's the class that we're gonna like pass in to our adapter, and we use we use the JSON adapter to parse the flyers JSON. Okay, great. So let's see. We have uh, is it 10, 10 minutes now? Okay. So yeah, I guess I'm going to get into the demo. So, uh, I'm not sure like how much time we're going to have for this, but we'll see. Um, and like for this one, you can just, uh, don't, don't really feel the need to follow along. You can sort of just watch and I'll just explain as I go. So, um, yeah, if you, if you want to follow along though, you can, you can try. <laughs> Uh, okay, so hopefully this will work. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so let me just get it, get the demo open really quick. Uh, let's see. Wait, that's not the right one. Oops. Hoping this one will be it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. So this is the demo from last time. So if you want to follow along, you can. Or maybe it's not. It's actually not last time. It's a probably like a couple times ago. <laughs> uh, so remember when we, uh, it was like kind of a longer demo, we like sort of tried to make eatery using a recycler view. So if you want to open that up, definitely feel free. Uh, I'm just gonna start just by running the app to make sure everything like works as we expect because uh, I just wanna make sure that this is the right project. So, uh... Yeah, it seems like some of this is a bit off. So let me let me fix this. Okay. Um yeah, okay. So as this is like loading in, I'm going to start. So just to give you like an overview of what we're actually going to be doing for this demo is we're basically want to code want to like use persistent storage in our in our eatery app. So okay, perfect. It's loaded. So the thing is like with this with this app, right? Um if I if I tried starring something, like right now I don't have the functionality coded in uh because we're going to be replacing it with persistent storage anyway. But if I tried to star an eatery, 
then if I close the app and reopen it, it wouldn't remember which eateries that I starred. So we want to add that functionality. And we also want to try to add the, um, we're also going to add like a little text box where you can put in your favorite eatery and it's going to store to local storage. So hopefully we'll have time to do all of that. Um, and if not, it's fine. We're just going to start with the text box because it should be pretty simple. So uh, let's go to Android view so we can see our XML. Okay, perfect. So here's our uh, recycler view. And what we're going to do, I'm just going to put an edit text. Um, and so you know, this like a size of 32. And now we're going to have to modify our constraints a bit. So um, yeah, so we're going to say top to top. Oh wait, that's already there. Okay, nice. Um, start to start a parent. So we're just adding in these constraints. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is make it so the recycler view is constrained to the bottom below this text. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I think that should be okay. There we go. Okay, yeah, so now we have our recycler view and we have this like text. And I'm also just going to like increase the width as well and give it, oh, it already has an ID. Okay, perfect. So now we're gonna go back to our main activity. And the main and the goal is that we want to essentially, whenever we edit this text, we want to um save the value, right? So let me close this up. And we're gonna first just start by getting like a reference to our edit text. Um, so we just do that with find view by ID. You should be experts at this by now. So um, edit text. And then what we want to do is we're going to set a uh, listener. So I think, let's see. Don't remember the exact syntax. Okay, so it's called do on text changed. Interesting. Okay, so we have, so we have this function. This is just going to execute whenever the text is changed. Um, we don't really care about the text before. We don't care about the text after. Uh, I don't think we care about the count either. And now we just want to deal with this text, right? So this is just like our syntax that we learned for shared preferences. So we're going to use share. Uh, so get shared preferences. Uh, and oh, wait, actually, so this is where we can like sort of think about it's kind of the singleton pattern, right? We want to use the same shared preferences every time. So we're going to create our shared preferences up here. And that's going to be equal to our context dot get shared preferences. And the shared preferences that we want to get. Uh, wait, do we even need this? Okay, sorry, you don't you don't actually need context. That's fine. Um, so the shared preferences that we're going to get. So we're going to call our file just shared preferences. Uh, and again, we're going to be accessing this in private mode. And now we have our shared preferences. We don't we don't actually need to get it. Um, but basically, whenever this favorite dining hall text changes, right, we want to shared preference dot edit, and we want to put the string. So this is like a good time to think about like what is our key going to be called. And a good practice can be to store your key in a variable. So this way, when you're like reading and writing to your key you don't have like the risk of maybe making a typo when you're typing out the string. So to do that, I'm going to make a, a const val. So um, that's it's basically the same thing as a value, except it only accepts primitive types. Uh, and so it's really good for keys, right? So we're going to call this uh, favorite dining. And that's going to be equal to, uh, let's see, what did I set the default value to? Yeah, I mean, doesn't, uh, it doesn't really matter. So we can just do favorite dining hall. So that's going to be our actual key that we use. So we want to put in this inside of this key, we're going to put the text that the user read, wrote. Um, and we might need two string. Okay, good. Awesome. Okay, so that's what happens when the text changes. And then we still need to uh, initialize our text. So when the user loads the app, we want to load, we want to basically load the uh the favorite their favorite dining hall and put it inside of that edit text right 
So we're going to say set text and we're going to get the string of our favorite dining hall. And for our default value, we're just going to say your favorite dining hall. Okay, cool. So that's that. Let's see if this works. Uh, yes. Does any, and like while we're testing this, anyone have any questions on like any of the code that I just did? Okay, so it looks like it's working so far. We have this your favorite dining hall default value. So I'm going to put my favorite dining hall, which is Keaton. Uh, and I don't, I don't know, maybe that's a hot take, maybe not. Uh, I'm going to get rid of my app and bring it back. Oh, I have so many apps here. Okay, hopefully it's the right one. That's not the right one. <laughs> okay, it's fine. I can just press play and it will it will select the right app for me. So let's hope that it's still there. Let's see. Okay, wait. <laughs> uh, let's figure out what happened. So, oh, yeah, actually, I have this highlight. Does anyone know what happened here? I remember I mentioned this highlight during the lecture. I was like, you might forget it. Apply, yes. <laughs> right, even I still forget apply sometimes, even though I put it like highlighted in the lecture. Okay, so we need to apply our changes. So now it should it should work. If it doesn't, I'm going to be pretty concerned. So let's rerun our app and see what happens. Okay. So we're going to say Keaton and we're going to close out of the app and rerun it. And hopefully there it is. So yeah, that was saved like permanently on the user's preferences file. So we are two minutes over uh, it uh, to talk a little bit about like how, how you would go about storing which dining halls you have starred. I'll just give like a brief overview of that. So what you might want to do is uh, let, let, let me see if I have it in here. Okay. Yeah. So basically like the issue, like an issue that you might run into is like, what do you use as your key? Because we don't really know, like if we, if we say Morrison as our key, Right. Then when I star Morrison, all of the Morrisons are going to get starred. Um, so like typically whenever you have an API that you're like calling from, like in this case, we're just hard coding the data. Whenever we have an API that we're calling from, we are basically usually those objects will have a, a unique ID associated with them. And this is like a really great choice for something to use as the key. So like these these dining halls might have some ID and then you would be able to say that the key is the ID. And then the value, we could actually use put Boolean. So we could put true or false, depending on whether it's selected, and then read from that value whenever the recycle review scrolls to it. So that's just like a conceptual overview of how you might go about implementing that. Uh, if you have questions, like definitely let me know. And we might actually have some extra time at the end of Wednesday's demo. So if we do, I can show how you would actually do this. But uh, yeah, thanks for staying over everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night and let me know if you have any questions. The half challenge information should be out on edge right now. Um, if you have any questions, please comment on that thread. But the team makes it this Friday, and next Monday the kickoff is required. We're canceling class to let you go to this. Six o'clock, the six fifteen. Location to be determined. Yes, and that will all be posted on Ed. Yes, and please add the Google Calendar okay. to your GCal. It's linked on the announcements.